I'm talking about economic, social and cultural rights. First, some history. In the late 1940s, a British sociologist, T.H. Marshall, mapped the historical progress of rights in a way that linked civil rights with the 18th century, political rights with the 19th century, and social rights were seen as the great leap forward that would characterize the 20th century. In terms of law, efforts to recognize certain forms of social rights go back a very long way. But we can usefully begin by noting the constitutions of Mexico and the Soviet Union in 1917, followed by that of the Weimar Republic and many of the Latin American constitutions of the pre-World War II era. At the international level, the creation of the International Labour Organization in 1919 was a direct response to the progress made by the proponents of communist systems of government. And the ILO sought to demonstrate that capitalism and social rights were compatible and even complementary. This was made much more explicit in the ILO's 1944 Declaration of Philadelphia. The same year, Franklin Delano Roosevelt called for a second economic bill of rights for the US. His efforts were then reflected in a proposal made by a prominent US group called the American Law Institute for the inclusion of social rights in post-war arrangements. In the subsequent negotiation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the ALI's formulation was strongly reflected in the final text, even though the driving force behind this breakthrough wasn't the USA, but was a combination of Latin American and European voices. The Universal Declaration made and makes no distinction in terms of categories of rights or the type of obligations that attached to different rights. But that consensus was short-lived and in 1951, under pressure from the West, the UN General Assembly voted to separate the rights into two distinct categories for the purpose of drafting binding treaty obligations. In the years that follow, the Cold War ensured that very little progress was made in this whole area of activity. Finally, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights was adopted in 1966. And in 1976, it had gathered enough ratifications by states to come into force. It remains the central treaty in this area, but reference also has to be made to a large number of specialized ILO conventions, to the 1961 European Social Charter, to the 1988 Inter-American Systems Protocol of San Salvador, and to the African Charter. There are also a lot of UN treaties dealing with discrimination against women, racial discrimination, and with the rights of children, migrant workers, and persons with disabilities that also contain important economic and social rights provisions. So what are the rights that we're talking about? Well, in theory, they're classified as being economic, social, or cultural. In practice, the boundaries and the characteristics of the various rights don't break down quite so easily into such categories, but I'll mention them anyway. Economic rights are thought of as the right to work, the rights associated with labor, and the right to social security. Social rights include the right to an adequate standard of living, the rights to food, housing, clothing, health, education, and more recently to water and sanitation. And the principal cultural right is the right to take part in cultural life, about which I'll say more later. What do these rights mean? Well, formulating and proclaiming rights is, in some respects at least, the easy part. The harder challenge is defining their scope and content, and thus the concrete obligations that attach to them. For this purpose, institutions are essential. At the national level, we know that courts are often the principal actors, but at the international level, the task falls to expert bodies established for this purpose. <music> 
The principal actors being the UN's Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. It was created in 1987, consists of 18 independent experts from different countries that have ratified the covenant. There are currently 162 such states, making it six fewer than for the Civil and Political Rights Covenant. This committee then evaluates the extent to which states are in compliance with their obligations by examining government reports, by questioning official delegations, and by taking account of information provided by civil society and other sources. This process results in the adoption of what are called concluding observations directed to the government, but also of potential significance to a wide range of other actors. The committee was recently given authority to examine individual complaints alleging violations of the covenant coming from any of the 14 states that have so far ratified the optional protocol that spells out the procedure to be followed. It also allows for an inquiry to be undertaken by the committee on the territory of a state in exceptional circumstances. The other major activity of the committee is the formulation of so-called general comments, a technique that is now used by almost all UN human rights treaty bodies and which enables the committee to offer an authoritative interpretation on a particular issue such as the implications of a right or other obligations flowing from the covenant. The best example there is <clears throat> the committee's general comment number three, which argued that there should be a minimum core for each of the social rights. That general comment was then picked up by the South African Constitutional Court, which made it the foundation for its early jurisprudence in this area. Overall, we can talk endlessly about international arrangements, but of course, it's the national level where the most important developments take place. Here, international lawyers and others initially turned to courts. There was a big emphasis on what's called justiciability to show that economic and social rights could be enforced by judges. There are many prominent examples of cases from India, South Africa, Colombia, Argentina, Brazil, range of other cases. But equally important are initiatives outside the formal judicial area. And here, social protection schemes, the social protection flaws that have been explored in a great many countries and promoted by the International Labour Organization are probably much more important at the end of the day than the judicial decisions which are given so much attention in the literature. What then is the place of economic and social rights within the overall human rights regime today? Well, on the one hand, the validity of these rights is rarely contested, although the United States has long sought to dilute their status. Happily, not with much success. These rights are reflected in all of the major treaties, in many national constitutions, and they're increasingly central to the work of many NGOs at the national level. But on the other hand, they continue to be inadequately reflected in the national legal systems and to occupy a distinctly secondary place in the work of most international human rights organizations, both governmental and non-governmental. Perhaps the main obstacle to the status of social rights is the view that they are inherently costly to achieve, whereas civil and political rights are not. The reality is that all rights are expensive if they're taken seriously, but that society must allocate the resources needed to ensure adequate policing and fair elections, just as much as the rights of children to education and the right of all of us not to die from hunger or inadequate health care. 
Another commonly heard argument is that social rights should be matters for democratic debate and political choices rather than being determined by courts. This is true, in part, but the same applies to civil and political rights. In both cases, the political process does and should determine the ways in which and the extent to which rights will be realised. But in both instances, their options are constrained by the obligations to ensure the respect called for in the international treaty obligations. There is no more an option to decide not to ensure adequate health care than there is to dispense with public policing. It's also said, in a throwback to Cold War days, that the realisation of civil and political rights will inevitably lead to respect for economic and social rights. Sadly, history doesn't support this optimistic assertion. Today, as the International Monetary Fund of all outfits recently pointed out, the United States' own statistics indicate that almost 50 million Americans live in poverty. What are the main controversies apart from those? First, the debate over individual versus collective rights. This is often overstated. All rights are individual in the sense that they pertain to, they are enjoyed by, exercised by individuals. Virtually no rights are useful unless seen in the broader collective context. There's no point in having a right to vote if there isn't a system to facilitate that. There's no point in having the right to exercise religious freedom unless a collectivity can do it. There's no point in saying that you have a right to food unless there is a social system which helps to bring that about. Next controversy, the extent to which there are international obligations to assist states in their realization of economic and social rights. Developing countries argue that the rich countries of the North have a direct obligation to provide financial and other forms of support. Countries of the North resist this and say that the real obligations lie at the national level and their efforts from the North will simply supplement when they possibly can. Another controversy is the extent to which extraterritorial obligations should apply. In other words, uh, if a transnational corporation in particular is operating in a country, should the obligations of the host, the, oh, sorry, of the home state apply in the host country? This is complex. I won't go into it further here. Finally, in terms of the future, interdependence of the two sets of rights has long been viewed as a slogan. It was formally endorsed by the Vienna, Con Vienna Conference in 1993, but it's now pretty widely recognised that the two sets of rights do and must go together. The human rights movement is not what it was in the 1970s. The focus is more complex, more sophisticated, and the integrality of the two sets of rights is increasingly a reality. In many ways, the enormous strides made, for example, in India with the inclusion of a right to education and a right to food in the national constitution and the adoption of major programs to give effect to those rights is an inspiration to many other countries. Finally, I should say that uh, I commend very strongly the organizers of this series and recommend that you consult their MOOC website on human rights courses, which are run by the Universidad Diego Portales in Chile.